Hey guys, welcome back to another Kubernetes video. Today we are going to be talking about etcd. This is a continuation of our series on the control plane and this will be our second video. We'll be talking about some of the details of etcd and how to deploy it. So let's jump right into it. So etcd is a highly available key value store. What does that mean in terms of being a key value store? Well, simply put, we store the data in the format of keys and their corresponding values. To compare with that, we can look at what a regular tabular format would look like. So you could think about your MySQL databases or something of that nature. That would be stored in a tabular format, but we can represent the same data in a key value format as we can see here. It stores the desired state of the Kubernetes cluster. So as we've talked about before, when we run a command using kubectl to create a pod, that's sent up through the API server and that is stored in etcd so that at a later date we can come back and check uh, what we'd actually deployed and uh, check up on the state of the deployment. Finally, it stores data in memory or flushes to disk. Now, etcd runs on what is called the Raft algorithm. The Raft algorithm is a distributed consensus algorithm, meaning that it ensures consistency of our data across the cluster. So you can imagine if we have a distributed uh, system like etcd where it's deployed across multiple different nodes and we write to a particular node, how do we know then if we want to read that data in the future and we read from a different node, how do we know that that data is going to be there? Well, Raft takes care of that. And part of the solution is through the use of commits. So when we have a, a multi-node cluster, like you can see here, we would only consider the data committed to the cluster as a whole when we have the data stored in at least two out of three nodes or a majority also known as a quorum we need to have the majority of the nodes to have received the data for that data to be committed to the cluster as a whole in the raft algorithm and in etc the nodes can be considered leaders followers or candidates so leaders are responsible for propagating the data to the other members of the cluster. The followers wait and listen for that data to be sent to them by the leader. And if they do not hear from the leader within a specified amount of time, they become candidates. And when they're candidates, an election is run. And that is how a new leader is found. So let's say our leader node goes offline. That would be a bad situation for the cluster if we didn't have this election system where nodes become candidates and then they can potentially become the new leader. There are a lot of details there that I'm skipping over in terms of the raft algorithm. We could go into you know another 30 minutes of depth on the algorithm, but just remember that this is how we ensure the state of our etcd cluster and ensure that we have consistent data when we're reading and write, writing to etcd. The Raft algorithm is derived from reliable and fault tolerant, so that's an easy way to remember the name. Um, and if you want to look into it, I'll leave a, a link in the description to um, videos that I found helpful in understanding the Raft algorithm. So when we're deploying etcd, there are a number of requirements that have to be met in terms of compute and storage resources. First of all, memory. Our RAM or memory is not normally one of the major constraints for etcd when we're encountering um, issues with etcd, but we do have to meet um, that requirement and if we reach the limit of what we have provisioned that will impact the performance of our cluster. So for standard clusters, generally eight gigabytes of memory um, 
is sufficient for heavily utilized clusters we would want to move to 16 to 64 depending on the situation and when we say heavy deployments here in terms of etcd we're talking about tens of thousands of writes um, or requests from clients per second so you know we're talking big volumes cpu cpu is rarely a resource that impacts etcd um, generally we're looking at two cores for standard clusters and for those heavy deployments as i mentioned before similar criteria we're looking at 8 to 16 cores with disk this is where um, we often see bottlenecks in terms of etcd performance so it's very important that we get um, our disk correct so it's critically important for performance and stability if the flushest disk take too long heartbeats can time out causing elections and this is where we might see a scenario like an election storm where our cluster is just constantly trying to find the leader over and over again and not actually getting any work done in terms of you know servicing requests so we need to make sure that our disk is fast so write latency is the key metric here and it should be sequential write latency so when you think about your etcd cluster it is a state machine as a whole what does that mean that means that every operation has to give us a guaranteed outcome so that we can transition into a new state as such we can't rely on concurrent writes to or just concurrent operations in various uh, different scenarios particularly with disk so we need to ensure that when we're provisioning our disk it has to be highly performant in terms of, in terms of sequential input output operations per second the bandwidth is important as well but generally the bandwidth is more important for when a node goes down and we're recovering that node we need to write a massive amount of data to that node so that it catches up in terms of state with all of the other nodes in the cluster so in order for you to understand the difference between IO ops and bandwidth, let's consider the um, case of writing, say you have to write a essay. IO ops will be the number of words that you are able to write per minute, whereas bandwidth would be the total amount of characters that you've written. So IOPS doesn't take into consideration the size of the words, it's just getting that write or read completed within the time. Another important uh, consideration when we're provisioning our etcd cluster for production is network. We need to have a fast and reliable network um, and especially it needs to be reliable because if we're dropping a lot of packets while transferring our data the likelihood is we're going to see errors in our etcd cluster as i mentioned the scenario of recovery for me members again it's very important here in terms of network bandwidth um, so network bandwidth could be a limiting factor so we should be looking for one to ten gigabyte connection we also want latency to be as low as possible so you can think about latency as the time to send a message between two points generally latency will be dictated by the physical distance that is between the nodes in our cluster so etcd recommends that our nodes are either co-located in the same data center or located in nearby data centers um, if we need to provide that disaster protection in case a whole data center were to go down which is a it's a possible scenario so security there are two considerations that we have to take into account here 
first one is secure communication. So when we are looking at our cluster, our communication can either take place between the nodes or it can take place between the nodes and the API server. So we should have um, essentially encrypted traffic in both of those scenarios. Then we have access control. We should use uh, TLS authentication. This is a built-in feature of etcd, so um, there is documentation on this, I'll mention it in a second. Um, yeah, so you can check that documentation out. I'll also link it in the description so it's easier for you to go to the URL. Um, but yeah, we just need to use TLS authentication when communicating between our API server and our etcd nodes. Now, how we deploy etcd into our Kubernetes cluster has an impact when we are trying to deploy a highly available Kubernetes cluster. We have essentially two options. The first scenario is a stacked topology, like is shown here in the diagram. And what this means is that all components of our Kubernetes control plane are deployed within the same um, virtual machine or physical server, just within the same control plane node. So this means that we'll need um, a minimum of three control plane nodes for our cluster to be highly available. It also means that if a node goes down, we lose everything. We don't just lose um, you know, our API server, our controller manager and our scheduler, we also lose etcd and vice versa, when we lose etcd, we lose the other components. So that um, loss in terms of a single node has a bit more of a wide blast radius in terms of impact. The other um, potential setup for a highly available Kubernetes cluster is using external etcd nodes. In this case, as shown in this diagram, our control plane components are deployed onto a node, but etcd is entirely separate and is deployed onto separate nodes. And the API server simply communicates with that separate machine. It requires twice as many nodes um, in this scenario to set up a HA cluster. So we're obviously gonna need our three control plane nodes, but we're also gonna need our three etcd nodes. However, it does bring the benefit of being able to independently scale or even initially when we're setting up our cluster, we may decide we want five etcd nodes, but we only need three um, control plane nodes. That would be perfectly fine. Gives us a little bit more flexibility and it reduces the blast radius. If one of our hosts goes down, say we may only lose the control plane components if a control plane node goes down, or we may only lose an etcd host if etcd goes down. And one last thing to mention is that it is recommended in production environments to deploy five etcd nodes in our etcd cluster. This is a recommendation from the etcd team. Etcd doesn't necessarily scale um, and provide better performance as it scales. So we do not want to set up any auto scaling rules or anything like that for etcd. If we have assessed the scenario and we want to change the number of nodes, we may go ahead and do that, but that's only for specific edge cases. As a default, we'll want to set up our five node etcd cluster, which may or may not mean five node control plane cluster and then um, as required if our Kubernetes cluster grows we can scale our etcd nodes vertically rather than horizontally. So that is it for our video on etcd. I hope that was useful. Um, if you have any questions please do leave a comment. I'd be happy to answer and please like and subscribe and I will talk to you in the next video.